Well, thank you very much uh, to organizers and everyone. And thanks for the patience. And uh, thank you very much for <laughs> bringing us on this platform. Uh, quite frankly, almost everything that I have heard so far resonates with uh, my thinking, uh, my ideas, and of course, comments I've actually given out. I'm privileged to also, you know, work as, uh, you know, part-time editor on the front page news with Classic FM uh, on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. And these are some of the things uh, we highlighted. Uh, there's a difference between protest. There's a difference between, in fact, there's a thin line between protest and riot. Yes. So I, um, I, I think now we are, are now understand that there's a thin line between protest uh, and riot and how from one it can go into the other. And some of the things we saw or some of the things highlighted by especially uh, our uh, professors uh, and doctors are number one, rights of you to protest, also right for you not to protest. Mm. And I did say once that you do not have the right to obstruct me from going about my own normal business. And I did also say then that it will only get to a point where those people who were, you know, happy with the protest will come up and say, we do not want to, because Nigeria, quite a number of Nigerians are those who live on, you know, daily earning. If I do not go out, I will not eat, I will not feed. So we have the artisans, we have the market people, we have even the hairstylists, we have them, you name it. It is just few people who are privileged to earn their salaries in the month, whether they go to work or not, whether there is a, a, a protest somewhere or not, you'll be paid. So if we only get to a point, these people will say, no, we do not want you. So now let's go to the issue of fact checking because I'm just trying to paraphrase and, you know, but the, the main issue here is about fact checking for me. And it's something that I realize is very key for us. Uh, the profession is so precious to me, precious to everyone. Uh, but the thing here is that we have left the arena of professionalism and we got into the arena <clears throat> quite sadly. So even our, our colleagues, my colleagues, they are on the social platform where you have only one thing, fake news. I wasn't too far from the protest ground. Yes, uh, the lucky uh, phase one access, even in, you know, uh, at about eight o'clock, I could hear, you know, shots, uh, you know, sound of gunshots, sporadic, and it was coming intermittently, and everyone was worried. That was on a Tuesday, I still can remember. Then on Wednesday, I was supposed to go to uh, work on Wednesday for the front page news uh, at Classic FM, but I couldn't go because while I was at prayers in the morning, intermittently, I was still hearing gunshots sound. So, oh my God, perhaps something terrible had happened. Then pretty much later, I was able to go out and I saw the devastation from Admiralty Road, a couple of other places. I was afraid to proceed towards that place. But at the point I was able to look and I said, go back home. So I went back and I said to myself, my colleagues have all gone out to say two key things. Even in the morning, uh, we had said no. Some of our colleagues had even gone ahead to use the word genocide. And I said, wait a minute, genocide is mass killing on account of maybe race, religion, affiliation. But so how did we get into genocidal, you know, issues? Then that ruled out. Then because I went out the next day, <clears throat> though I didn't go too deep into the axis where they had converged, and it hadn't rained. So I was hoping to see at least a lot of things that would give, you know, Philip to what many of us were saying, that there was a massacre. And I didn't see all of that. Since it didn't rain, nothing would have washed off, you know, quite a number of, you know, evidential, uh, you know, things that we can put our hands on. 
So I went back and we started checking. The first thing that came to mind was someone who had been declared, you know, dead on the 19th on Facebook. And on the 20th, I saw that, and I'm happy you mentioned uh, Bashir Lucas Samson. Myself and Lucas were actually working together. We were comparing notes uh, back and forth. I was, you know, we were always comparing notes. And we realized that that same individual, that his friend had said, rest in peace on the 19th, is now being said, had been killed on the 20th. That was a red flag. Another red flag was the home video, you know, a bad moss lady who is a, a Nollywood actor who was also said to have been killed in that protest. And she came out to say, look, I'm alive. So we started putting everything one after the other, subjecting them to facts. And I also wrote to, um, I, I remember Time. I wrote to Time magazine because Time came up writing a very lengthy piece on the protest. And from start to finish, everything Time wrote was based on what we had seen in the social media. And I wrote Time. I said, you should be able to you know, get yourself out of this whole mix. If anyone is saying anything, it shouldn't come from Time magazine. Time should get its facts right that we live in a community. Every African community, we live a, com we, we live, we live a communal life. And a communal life then means that if anyone dies, you must see the family. If anything happens to anyone, you must see the family. So I now asked the question, I said, did, you remember the famous uh, tweet there, I said, uh, did Sawalu, that is the governor, did he lie when he said there wasn't a massacre? No, initially I said, did he lie when he said no one died? And I asked, was there a massacre? In the other questions I asked, I left them unanswered. But when he got to, was there a massacre? And I said, no, categorically. And of course, you know, the mob attack, I, I'm used to all of that. So everyone, because in the social media, I also realized that on social media, a lot of people are, you know, impassioned illogical, incensed, uh, to the extent that we can't pause for a minute to put some of these things on your scale of logic to critically analyze and find them, you know, uh, to, you know, to gauge them to see if they, they, they are false or truth. And the most shocking thing is that colleagues who are supposed to be really great professionals that should even be the ones subjecting these things to you know, scrutiny, verification, were also in the arena saying what everyone was saying. So two things here. <clears throat> we were almost going to lose a nation, mm. a country, based on a lie. And the lie is that there was no massacre. Yes, people were shot. As I said, until the next day, I couldn't, I did my program over the phone. The newspaper analysis was done over the phone the next day on Classic FM, which was on a Wednesday. I didn't go there physically. So it tells you it was not even too safe. So pretty much later I said, I drove out and it was as if Lagos had gone to sleep. There was everything, as if there was a civil war. Everything, what you saw in the movie, every, there was dead silence. So I, I came back. So we started looking at all of this. So the thing here is that the media didn't help matters. Just the same way I also wrote, I said, NBC, whatever NBC had done to Channel Television, which is home to me, Arise News, which is also home to me, then I said, the only thing about NBC and that sanction is the timing. I didn't say that they were wrong in what they did. Because if you jumped into the arena and you bring unverified materials to the people, you are liable. But the timing was wrong because it was at a time where <clears throat> the nation was going through a whole lot. We're talking about healing. We're talking about rebuilding the countries, uh, the country and the cities. And a lot of people were already emotional. So no matter what NBC did, 
no one or quite a lot of people will not see any logic or sense in it. So timing for NBC was wrong, but what NBC said, the broadcasters, they know that they goofed mm. away from that. So now this has also been pretty much well done that we have Muiwa uh, here, the uh, spokesperson of the police. I also took our time to invite him to my show when this was going on. And we had a big conversation. And some of the things I also looked at is, uh, rather, we have an issue of education here and an issue of class. And I'll explain. Those we call hoodlums, those we call miscreants, were actually also protesters. The difference is in education and class. Because those who were protesting in Lekki Axis, if you look at it, the mix of people who have some form of education, people who are a little bit well-to-do, so they were able to comport themselves in the best of manners. Mm. The one in Orile, his own idea of a protest is to destroy anything he or she sees. So it's not to come up with the same uh, carnival-like scenario we saw at Lekki. Mm. So even the police, they knew that this was pretty much a bad scenario. The only thing that kept that thing going was that for a very long time, it did not, you know, move from the Lekki axis to so many other parts of Lagos. Mm. So because they were there, it was good that they were there. So whoever wants to protest, whether you are in a relay, you will move away from your area and come to Lekki and stay mm. with them. But it got to a point because there was a problem again. Because they kept on saying, we do not have leaders. It was also difficult for us to come to the table and have a conversation. Because we couldn't co come to the table to have that conversation, it actually got out of hand. And in getting out of hand, our own people, the media, were also enmeshed deeply because we're all, already polarized and divided, which shouldn't be so. Thank you.